Hello gardeners! So you're looking to add awesome plants to your garden that bloom in July. Well, we're going to start with the one right behind me, and that is anise hyssop, and then you're going to see many others that bloom in July as well. Um, this usually grows three to four feet tall. The ones in my garden basically reseed, and most of them will only be three to four feet tall, but sometimes you get a tall one like this. Anise hyssop has these beautiful lavender colored blooms. It grows in full sun to part shade and reseeds pretty prolifically. In fact, if you have some type of rocky area, it will reseed itself in very dry, rocky soils. It is also loved by people who cook. Um, it's very edible. It, the leaves smell of licorice and it has a licorice taste to them as well. So there are many recipes um, for how to use it in dishes. Another attribute is that it is highly deer resistant. For, so those of you with deer problems, this is a great plant for you. As you can see, it is a favorite of pollinators. So just think about how much activity you'll be adding to your garden and how you will be helping our bees and other pollinators. Now, sometimes new gardeners are afraid to be around bees, but as you can see, I'm standing right next to this plant. They don't bother me. Um, they're after nectar, not humans. And gardeners, just check this out. One of my favorite times is as the anise hyssop goes to seed, the goldfinches will come in and they will become a daily sight in my garden um, towards the end of July and into August as they come in to feed on this plant. So it's just another fantastic reason for having it in your garden. All the life you are attracting, including these bright yellow goldfinches. In order to learn more about anise hyssop, on Native Plant Channel, I do have a short video dedicated just to this plant that grow, goes into more detail about all its attributes and how much you're gonna love it. So please check the video on anise hyssop on Native Plant Channel. July is a hot, humid month in the Northeast. So the plants we're going to be looking at need to be able to withstand those conditions. With our native plants, they are up for this job. Here you have orange milkweed. Unfortunately, the milkweeds are so poorly named with that word weed in them that you know becomes unattractive to gardeners. But most of you know of these plants because you know of their value to the monarch butterfly. Um, they're in the genus Asclepius, which is actually for the name of the Greek god of medicine, so named by the Greeks. This plant is a tough plant in poor, rocky soils to average soils. It likes dry conditions and full sun. Um, let it grow in your garden. It will grow up to two and a half feet tall, although occasionally on a specimen that is several years old, I've seen them get a little bit taller, but it's low growing, attractive, and it will help out our monarch butterflies as it is one of the milkweeds that they eat as caterpillars. Um, you will see that here. So imagine going out one day into your garden knowing that your garden is helping to sustain our monarchs, um, these fantastic butterflies that take a journey of thousands of miles to Mexico every fall where they spend their winter in uh, fir forests that are high up in the mountains. Here are the rosy pink blooms of swamp milkweed, which you can tell from its name, will grow in average to wet soils. Um, this plant, if you have both this and orange milkweed in your garden, I have found that monarchs prefer swamp milkweed for egg laying. But um, it's an attractive plant, which also supports many other insects as well. Just going to take you on a quick tour of this section of the garden so you can get an idea of how uh, some of the plants are being used. This fine-leaved plant that looks needle-like, that's Hubrix amsonia, uh, which has already bloomed but looks great in the fall with the yellow leaves. Right to the right of it is a Baptisia. This is a white Baptisia that I spoke about being in, uh, in the June video, what was in bloom in June, and the lavender spikes again of... Um, the anise hyssop. 
Now the white flowers you're coming upon is pearly everlasting. And this is a plant that is not widely available and many gardeners don't know it. Its small white flowers have yellow centers and they may look somewhat familiar to you because they are used in dried flower arrangements. So that's a popular use for them. They bloom from July into August and are quite hardy. They're hardy in zones three to eight and grow one to three feet tall. Um, they like full sun to part shade and will grow in average soil to poor soils. So you don't have to have a nutrient rich soil to grow pearly everlasting. It tolerates drought once established as well. For viewers who have problems with deer, you may be looking at the gray leaves of Pearly Everlasting and thinking, hmm, is this deer resistant? And oh yes, it absolutely is. The deer leave this plant alone. My favorite reason for growing Pearly Everlasting is that it is the caterpillar host plant for the American Lady Caterpillar. So here you have an American Lady, this beautiful butterfly, which on the, um, the top side of its wings is orange and black. Here you have one laying eggs on the plant. Um, just look at the tip, the bottom of its body, as it places its eggs there. So you're going to see leaves eaten on your pearly everlasting, and that's going to be a great thing, because that means that you have caterpillars and are creating more butterflies. As we swing around, you might be noticing the very tall yellow flowering plant on the right. That is yellow coneflower. Look at the beautiful soft yellow color of this yellow coneflower, also called gray-headed coneflower. It grows in full sun in either clay soils or sandy soils, so it's pretty adaptable, and grows in poor dry soils. It was once used to cure toothaches. Its seeds are eating, eaten by the birds, so you'll also be able to feed the birds. And um, it likes either average moisture to dry. So again, many of the plants that we are seeing, once they are established, you don't have to worry about watering your garden, so you don't become a slave to your garden. July is a great time for pollinators. So the plants you're going to be seeing are going to help you have butterflies, bees, and other insects in your garden that you can enjoy. And gardeners, the plant that you're looking at right now is mountain mint, and it gets an A++++ for pollinators. Just take a look at all the activity on this, and this is not at a certain time or some unusual time. Mountain mint is loaded with pollinators from the time its flowers start blooming in July until uh, the autumn comes. Um, so this is not an unusual event. This is all the time when the flowers are in bloom. The flowers themselves are small and insignificant right in the center, but it is those silvery bracts that surround them that give the uh, plant its really attractive look. It kind of looks like a little dusting of, of silver on there. Um, so it looks fantastic, and boy, is this plant deer resistant. When crushed, it is a fragrant, a sort of, a, it's a very strong fragrance. I actually don't like the fragrance, but I think that's what makes it so deer resistant. Um, it grows in full sun to part shade in zones four to eight, and it's easy care, does not need staking. All you have to do is cut back the previous season's uh, stems in the spring, and um, that's all you really have to do. It's very strong stems. It can grow from, it usually grows about three to four feet tall um, and does not need any staking whatsoever. It is native all along the East Coast from Maine to Georgia and uh, Native Americans used it to treat fevers, cold, and stomach aches. Um, as you can see, it has bees and wasps and the smaller butterflies are attracted to it. So give mountain men a try. The beautiful flowers of wild senna bloom from July into August in full sun. This is a back of a border plant because it eventually grows six feet tall or more. Um, it tolerates clay soil and average moisture. It is a legume so you know that you're going to get the pea-like pods when it goes to seed. 
Um, and another wonderful feature is that this is the larval host plant for sulfur butterflies, which are large yellow butterflies. Native Plant Channel is also found on Facebook, so please check Facebook for more information as well. Check out yellow wild indigo. It is a small, airy looking plant growing two to three feet tall. And like all Baptisias, it is tough. This one grows in rocky, poor soils. It is very doubt tolerant, tolerant. And in my garden here, it's obviously planted in the wrong place um, as the plants around it kind of outgrow it. But I'm afraid to move it because Baptisias have a long tap root and do not like being moved. But if you're looking for something a little bit smaller, airier looking, it's got a long bloom period from June into August. Gardeners are ecosystem managers. They decide what lives and dies in their garden. So by planting native plants and by not using pesticides, you are helping to create a fantastic habitat and helping our ecosystems improve. By doing so, you also inspire others as they see your work in your garden. A Native Plant Channel's video on June blooming plants, I went into detail on oak leaf hydrangea. Here, I just wanted to share the progression. You know, what does it look like later after June? And you'll see the flowers are turning these lovely chartreuse colors. They'll continue to turn colors and um, be stunning still throughout the summer and into the fall as the leaves turn of uh, fall colors. Gardeners, look how awesome the seed heads of wood oats look waving in the breeze. They're just a very attractive plant. This is a perennial grass with blue-green leaves. It is clump forming but does reseed uh, pretty aggressively. It is a low maintenance plant that only requires cutting back in the spring and uh, it grows two foot tall although I have seen specimens grow much taller. For those of you looking for a shade plant, this is a great one. Um, it will also grow in sunnier sites where it picks up more of a nice yellow fall color in a sunnier site and the seed stalks can be used in flower arrangements. The birds love to eat the seeds. Wood oats also does well in wet locations. In fact, another name for it is river oats because it grows along river banks. So you might want to consider it if you have a wet shady location. I am now sharing with you some July blooming native plants, but that I don't actually have in my own garden. Um, here you're looking at American Beautyberry and it's pink and white flowers in July. This is an understory shrub that grows three to five foot tall so you know that it prefers part shade um, however it is most spectacular feature is its beautiful magenta berries in the fall these berries are an important fall food source for songbirds uh, beautyberry is adaptable to varying soil conditions from sandy to clay but it does not like to dry out Flux is Greek for flame, an apt description for just how much attention it commands in the garden when in bloom. It is a staple of the summer garden and a favorite of gardeners and pollinators, especially the clear wing moths. Flux is a truly North American genus with 60 of 61 species native to this continent and 25 species native to the eastern United States. However, when we talk about flocks in summer, the queen is garden phlox or phlox paniculata. Under the proper growing conditions, it lives for many years and is hardy in zones four to eight. It is long blooming from July well into August and usually fragrant, growing from two to four feet tall. German plant breeder Carl Forster stated that a garden without phlox is not only a sheer mistake, but a sin against stomach. Flocks is available in a range of shades from purple to pinks to whites. And like so many of our native plants, Americans didn't really appreciate it, and it was Europeans who took them to Europe, hybridized them, and then sold them back to us. Plant it where it will receive at least six hours of sun per day and good air circulation, as it does have a problem with powdery mildew. Another plant with an unfortunate name is sneezeweed. You can see the beautiful orangey, yellow, rusty colors that it comes in. 
which are perfect for fall, but it actually starts blooming in July and can bloom into the fall. It grows in full sun in medium to wet soils and tolerates clay soil. So if you have a wet spot, try this out. It's hardy in zones three to eight, and um, its height is from three to five feet, usually in the three to four foot um, category. And um, one of the reasons, or the reason for its name of sneezeweed, is that at one time the flowers were used to make a, a powder um, that was used as snuff, thus the sneezeweed. Enjoy these native plants right in your own garden as you inspire others to do the same as well, making our world a better place. Blazing Star is a beautiful plant that makes a nice architectural statement in the garden. It likes full sun and grows in average soils. There are several species that are all native and they vary from one foot in height to five feet in height, with most of them being two to four feet tall. They do fine in average soils and even non-gardeners are familiar with this plant as it makes a great cut flower and is used in many floral arrangements. Oh, and the beautiful purple coneflower, a tough native hardy in zones three to nine that stands up to heat, humidity, and drought and is at its best when it receives at least six hours of sun. Soil moisture is, should be dry to medium. It grows two to four feet tall and begins blooming in July and lasting for many, many weeks. It's also good as a fresh cut or dried flower, but leave them so that the birds can feast on their seeds. This will also allow them to reseed, which they do easily, and should be divided every three to four years. Let the seed heads remain on the plant through the winter for architectural interest and for use as a bird feeder with no work on your part. Often advertised as deer resistant, this is incorrect as they are liked by deer and groundhogs. As a native plant gardener, you are using these plants to improve our ecosystems. Therefore, stick with the pink varieties and avoid the yellow, orange, or any variety that has some type of unusual flower shape that doesn't look like the species. There are many cultivars out there, but the Xerxes Society has found that only the pink or white single flowered ones actually benefit our pollinators. The others won't be visited by them. Thank you so much for what you are doing to help create a better world, one garden at a time. Please subscribe to Native Plant Channel and click the bell so that you can be notified when a new video is posted. There are so many coming up with everything from fragrant native plants to uh, plants blooming in different seasons to more deer resistant native plants. So please subscribe and click the bell. Also look for Native Plant Channel on Facebook where you can find additional information. Thank you so much for watching, for being inspired to create an eco-friendly garden that helps make our world better, one garden at a time, right in your own garden. Thanks. Have a great day.